everybody. Welcome to episode number 233 of the SoxProspects.com podcast. We have the web's number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system from top to bottom, from Fort Myers to Worcester, across the Pike to Fenway, and all stops in between. Thank you for listening. My name is Chris Hatfield, and I am the executive editor of Sox Prospects, joined as always by our director of scouting, a guy who the offense is flowing through, but every team we play knows it, and I think he needs to pass the ball a little bit more. Ian Cundall. Ian, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be back on after uh, a long absence of what was it? It's been a, been a couple weeks. And uh, has yeah. it even been two weeks? I think it's been. Less I, I don't know. I don't Fewer know. Than, but, I think uh, it's a week and a half. Anyway. But, but the stove is sizzling. So uh, it is it's time it's to not, talk some baseball. It's not quite quite piping hot, but it's it, it's it's reaching a nice simmer, I think might be what I would call it. Uh, Eduardo Rodriguez is gone. We'll recap that as well as some other rumors surrounding the major league team, players they've been connected to. And of course, this Friday is the Rule 5 protection deadline, uh, November the 19th. I, I presume at 5 p.m., Ian, although I don't know that for sure, but that sounds right to me. It's not midnight. They don't do stupid midnight deadlines like that anymore. I presume it's 5 p.m. Eastern, but at any rate, the deadline is Friday for the Red Sox to add players to the 40-man roster in order to protect them from the Rule 5 draft. We'll talk a little bit about that process, who we think they'll protect, uh, and, and all relevant conversations surrounding that on this episode of the show. Before we get too far in, though, we want to say if you want to support the show, you can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you're listening to this. A little thumbs up on YouTube never hurt. Uh, you know, whatever star you need to put on the show on Spotify or whatever uh, platform you're listening on, we always appreciate it. And you can also support the show on patreon.com slash Sox Prospects. That's the way you can pledge a certain amount per episode and get some neat perks, including the Patreon game updates, uh, the rankings update uh, specials for our patrons, including who the, who players 61 to 70 were, uh, and as well as our individual top 20s, I think I've been doing. Uh, might, have been, might be top 30s, I forget. But uh, we've got a final regular season, final season update uh, our season end update, I guess it's called, uh, for 2021 is going to be coming up in the coming week or so. So if you want to be able to check out exclusive content related to that, head over to patreon.com slash Sox Prospects. And of course, send your emails to podcast at SoxProspects.com. We want to talk about what you want to hear about. So hit us up there. We want to t- answer your questions, respond to your thoughts, your concerns, things you want to know about. That's the best way to get us to talk about it is send us an email. So send them in. we got a few for this episode. Uh, Ian, let's jump right in. I guess the, the really the biggest news is Eduardo Rodriguez on Sunday night, I believe, Ian, declined the qualifying offer. I somewhat incorrectly <laughs> said that it wasn't a big deal. Don't read into it. It's a formality. I think the thing that I had not really thought enough about is the timing because most guys had either immediately declined or we're going to wait until either the deadline, which is um, tomorrow, the 17th, which is when we were originally planning on recording, but with Rodriguez signing elsewhere, there was no reason to wait. Um, Yeah, they were either going to wait to the deadline, but then suddenly in the middle of the period, he declines it. Probably should have been a hint. And then, of course, he signed with the Detroit Tigers for five years, $77 million dollars. What do you think? Uh, it's an interesting contract. It's front loaded. It's got an opt out. No, it's not. No, 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 Sorry, no, no. back loaded. I misspoke. Back loaded. It's a two year, twenty eight million dollar deal on the front mm-hmm. end with an opt out after year two. Three. After oh yeah, after after year two, year yeah, two yeah. before year three. Yep. Yeah. And then it becomes a three year, forty nine. No. Three or forty nine, yeah, forty nine million dollar deal. Yep, three or forty nine million dollar deal. So it's like fourteen million for the first two years, then sixteen and a third for the last two. Exactly, or three. Um, Sorry, last three. Last three, right? What do you? What are your thoughts? Because I think we both kind of had the same initial reaction to five seventy seven is something the Red Sox could have matched and seemed fair. It's in between the MLB trade rumors and Fangraphs projections. It's not out there. To me, the big thing was the opt-out, but I'm interested in, in what your thoughts were on the deal. I think it's a great deal for the Tigers. I'm kind of surprised the Red Sox didn't offer it, uh, didn't match it or go to if that they, if, if they were given the chance to, which we don't Fair. know they were. Especially seeing what like Noah Syndergaard just got. I One year, $21 million. Yeah, for the and they gave up a pick. It's 
ludicrous, but whatever. It's less um, ludicrous if you think the Angels are going to sign another qualifying offer for you. Yeah, and they're going to lose that pick anyway. But fair. But still, I agree. With still, you. um, I just like it's basically a two year. What is it? Twenty. It's a two year, twenty million dollar deal, and then. Yep. He has the security of if he's bad, he can opt in for three years at 49, which is higher salary. And if he, so basically, you know, it's the Tigers are assuming a lot of risk. And I have a feeling the way the contract was structured is what pushed the Red Sox away from it. Because with this, they're literally assuming every risk. Like if he gets hurt, he's going to opt in. If he sucks, he's going to opt in. Mm -hmm. If, you know, he's excellent, he's just going to opt out and they lose him after two years. And I I have a feeling that that's why the Red Sox weren't interested because I think the total money is very fair. And I think it's something I would have done in a heartbeat if I was them. Mm -hmm. But I do also wonder how much the calculus is that the Red Sox are going to get a pick at what is it? It's like 70 ish around there. It's in the early seventies, probably. Yeah. Like compensation. It also could just be, they thought that 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 pick was worth more than him at that number. And if that's the case, I mean, yeah, that's, you know, that's their choice. If they can go out and they sign, you know, a comparable pitcher, to a shorter deal or for less money, then it starts to make sense. But I think we're kind of, this is the first step of the, this is the first big domino to fall for them with the pitching. Mm-hmm. And now we need to see what the next move is because I still maintain they need two starters. Yes. And that was, and that was, yeah, that was like, and that was, if one of them was Eduardo Rodriguez, I was kind of assuming, but now that he's gone, I, I think they have to go out and get two guys. And they've obviously been linked with a bunch of guys like Matt's John Gray guys like that. But it seems like they're kind of hunting in the non QO pitcher market, which I kind of agree with because I don't really want to sign any of the pitchers who got a QO to the money they want. Like, I wouldn't have done that Syndergaard deal. I don't want to go give Marcus Stroman as good as he is and as funny as that tweet was today talking trash about the Yankees. I don't want to give him, you know, five years, 100 million or something. Like, that just scares me given his size, unfortunately. And um, I'm who's the who's the other QO for oh, Robbie Ray? I'm I'm not touching Robbie Ray like at his the money he's going to get. So I just think that it's going to be it's kind of like wait and see. And you know, Eduardo Rodriguez was a great development. Good job by the Red Sox. Kind of the whole thing. They got him in a trade for what was it, Andrew Miller? I Andrew Miller for two months of Andrew Miller. And so that was a great. Where they weren't great competing. trade. Then they did a good job developing him because I believe he was coming off kind of an inconsistent year. The stuff was there, but he could never put it together, put it together in the upper minors with them. Turned into a very reliable mid-rotation starter who show flashes of better. And now, you know, yeah, he, he got his payday and good for him. But at the same time, it does leave a pretty big gap in the Red Sox rotation because as much as people wanted to like hate on Eduardo Rodriguez for his performance this year, he got screwed oh, by the defense. He was one of the top, he was one of the better pitchers in the American League this year. And if he was playing in front of a competent like defense, his numbers would look very different. I, I like I think it by war we talked about it. He was like the top ten pitcher in the AL, and it showed. You know, this is the end of the day. We talk about that they're not looking at his ERA when they're paying him. You know, he doesn't get a five year seventy seven million dollar deal off his ERA. He gets it off his performance on the mound in ter- what his pitches look like and you know expected performance and his expected performance. He should have done better this year. He just what unlucky. And going forward, I think that the you know the Tigers are paying him like what he is, you know, a solid number three starter with a chance to be like a low end number two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you know Eduardo Rodriguez kind of unfairly gets painted. One thing that kind of drives me nuts is he still gets painted with the injury prone brush. He's not he ha- he hasn't been injury prone for three years. He missed the 2020 season because of complications from COVID, right? But for the period from 2019 through 2021 that includes the shortened 2020 season, he was in the top 25 in innings pitched, despite yeah, having and, missed the short season completely. And this year, how many innings did he throw this year? I don't know what it was, it was this like year. Was like 160 or something? Yeah, it was. I mean, he led the team in innings. I thought, oh, was he behind Ivaldi? Anyway, he threw 157 innings in the regular season this year. Yeah, so that's I, like that's a full season in the new COVID year because they weren't going to ramp him up after not pitching last year. And anyone who exactly. dings him as injury prone for last year is just being like, difficult. well, I, like, I don't think it's for last. That's unlucky. Year. That's not his fault. I think it's because he had a knee issue prior to 2019 that bugged him for two years, essentially, right on and off, and he would get little nicks and things that he'd miss a start. But like, there's no reason to think at this point that he's injury prone. He's not. The other thing, just doing a little bit of a postmortem, I mean, Rodriguez was acquired from Baltimore, as I mentioned, in a trade for uh, Andrew Miller at a point where he was in double A. 
And basically he's one of these guys that one of these pitchers who the second they leave the Baltimore Orioles organization suddenly is a lot better. Um, apparently they were trying to get him to throw, I believe a slower changeup. They were trying to remove yeah, velocity they, from the change. Yeah, he hated it. And he, he, hated, he hated it hated and it, it wasn't yeah. working. And he came in, the Red Sox were like, just throw the hell out of your changeup, whatever. Well, that's right. I, I remember seeing him because I had seen him with Bowie before when he was in double A. And then I saw him with Portland. And his changeup was like, they're trying to get him to throw like 80, 82 or something. And clearly, as we saw, he's comfortable with more in like the mid 80s. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, it was a good, it, it was a very good pitch. Like it was an effective pitch this year. So yeah. And, he, and so he was obviously, he was proven right with that. And the thing that I had forgotten, Ian, he was the top prospect in our rankings for a time. I mean, he was that, I think that's warranted. Like he's turned in, into in be a 2015. Very good, yeah. It's because it was during the year. People forget this. It was after Blake Swihart graduated. Oof. He, he rose to number one in the rankings in a system that included Joan Moncada, Raphael Devers. Um, well, that was when they were all like super far away. Oh, exactly. But yeah. I'm just saying like he was number one in a loaded system. Like Garen yeah. Cicchini was in the twenties. Like this was I mean, a loaded system. That was system. probably too high for him in hindsight, but Yes and no. Yes and no. I mean, you, it's, 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 we always say uh, rankings are a snapshot in time, right? It, it's, and it, there's projection at a given point in time. Uh, Manny Margot was number fourth in that. Uh, I knew there was another guy who was in that, in that top rankings that was pretty good. And then it gets to the like Brian Johnson, which five, Henry Owens was six. Um, uh, yeah, but at any rate, um, he was a former number one prospect in the system and they got plenty of value out of him. That's a, success, a successful trade. I wish him well. Um, uh, I think the opt-out, Ian, is what gets him to accept that deal pre-CBA expiration because that gives him a chance to evaluate what the new CBA does while getting him paid. It's a very, it, it's a very player-friendly deal in the sense that I think he sacrificed some long-term money. Like I think he could have got more if he waited Sacrificed some short-term money. I Sorry, think. yeah, short term money too. Oh, well, um, I mean, I'm agreeing with you on the long term, yeah, like, but short term too. Yeah, I think he made the decision that he wanted to set the market for pitchers, and he wanted he. It's a very clever contract for his people, um, as you said, with the way that it, the opt out allows him. You know, he can do a year under the new CBA, then figure out what the deal is. I believe he won't be able to get a QO offer next time because he's got one now, right? Isn't Presuming they keep the same rules, so who knows? But under the current structure he would yeah. not be able to get a qualifying um, offer again and he'll and, hit the fail of free agency at age 31 and frankly if he, if he pitches as well as he did this year and in 2019 the next two years he's opting out like that's a guarantee in my opinion no question it's yeah. so it's, it's a two-year but, deal with but, a, with if a something ha- but if something happens he's got that you know long-term security get more money and i think that's why the tigers did it too is it wasn't front-loaded they get him at a very i would say an under market value for the first two years but it gives him the the uh, the ability to evaluate things after those two years. How's everything working out? And then if he does, you know, they pay a little more. And if he opts in, I'm sure they'd be happy to, you know, unless I guess unless he's super well, injured or something happens. But opt, yeah, we'll opt-ins see. are always player friendly because now you're you're on the hook for three years for a guy. But um, he's going to count for like 15.4 million against the CBT, presuming they keep an AAV basis. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they get him for two years at that rate. And then in year three, they'll pay the difference that they didn't pay out. Assuming he opts out, which would probably be if he's getting 14, that's going to be like 2.8 million, which whatever I'll, t- I'll pay a $2.8 million tax for two in year three for two years of Eduardo Rodriguez. Yeah. So I, I, don't just, I, I wish they, uh, it was the old system and you got the pick of the team that you were that signed the guy. I know. I know. <laughs> so what the Red Sox, we mentioned, the Red Sox get a pick in the seventies after we, we say that it's it's technically a pick after competitive balance round B, which Correct. follows the second round of the draft. It goes round Correct. one, competitive balance A, round two, competitive balance B. We don't well, know so precisely it, where the pick is yet because there are all of these qualifying offer free agents, where they sign, where they're coming from, affects where the various compensation picks go and forfeited picks come from. So we don't know precisily where the pick is yet. But right and now also, it's around 70. And also it means that so the Red Sox have four of the top 70-ish picks right now. Mm-hmm. And I think we talked about last episode, but they can't lose the first two picks. The Fabian pick is on like losable because it's a mm-hmm. comp pick from the previous year. Yep. So if can't they were to sign a so if they were to sign a QA for QO free agent, their first pick that they'd be eligible to forfeit would be their second round pick, which is I think 57. 57 for now. Yep. And then if they sign another one, this pick could be lost. Yep. This is the next eligible pick, just so everyone understands. It wouldn't Precisely. be the third round pick. It would be this QO pick would be the next mm-hmm. one. 
And and I really do think, I mean, I'm looking at the players who received qualifying offers, you know, Brandon Belt, no, Nick Castellanos, nah. Michael Conforto, I don't see it. Freddie Freeman, I don't see it. I think uh, if they're going after right fielder, it seems like it's the guy from who's coming from uh, who was just posted Japanese today. Guy Suzuki is, is he Japanese? I just wanted to make sure I could say Suzuki. Exactly. Yep. He's yeah. in, he's an MP. Um, yep. He was apparently like they announced they were posting him today, and mm-hmm. the I, I believe it was Red Sox stats or someone talked said the Japanese media is just all o- saying the Red Sox are all over him. So really? I'm going to be interested to see what happens with that. Um, because I do, as we talked about in the last episode, you know, right field is somewhere they could upgrade, but they need to do it before the lockout starts. So, and they for need those to make wondering decision. what it would be, I think is you, you upgrade there and move Renfro is what you're suggesting. Yeah. I mean, Maybe you, throw try some to move, cash in. You, you try to move him, and if you can't trade him, you just probably non tender him, but yeah, like something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, cause, yeah. cause his arb number is definitely higher than I thought it was going to be. It's going to be like seven point eight, seven two five or something. Seven it's, five. It's in the yeah. sevens. Yeah. It's seven to 8 million, which I was pretty, cause I was thinking it was going to be closer to like six or five. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, I just like Redfro. He's kind of a polarizing player. Like he's fine, but I think if you can upgrade there, I would be open to it. If that makes sense. I wouldn't want to rely on him repeating his career year. No, because if you look the year before, it was atrocious. Like, right, I mean, and he's probably somewhere between those two years. And his defense really regressed this year. He's got a cannon arm, which kind of hides that his defense was not good this year. So, uh, yeah. Was it not good? I don't know that I... Yeah. It wasn't bad. I'll bring it up. Um, If you look at B-Ref... Oh, B-Ref doesn't do the thing I'm, I want to see. No. Does it? No, no they don't I mean. really have... Uh, He was negative... Uh. What am I looking for? His oh. defensive run saves was negative 26 this year in center field and negative eight in right field. Was it? DLS? Yeah. No kidding. Or sorry, sorry. It was neg- negative 26 in center field and uh, neutral in right field. He was negative eight. Overall. Uh, yeah, I was going to yeah. say, he's definitely not a sorry. center fielder. He's a right but, fielder. But even negative eight in right field is kind of bad. Like, well, But he's not negative eight in right field. You just said he's neutral in right field. No, no, no. He's negative eight. Um, He's he's. Runs Negative below eight. average total zone fielding runs below average, whatever that means. I don't. <laughs> well, let's, I mean, we can re we can reassess that uh, next yeah. episode. But I need to go to the fan grass page because that one I understand more. Baseball reference is confusing to me sometimes. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, let's let's look. Uh, yeah, let's get to the good stuff. What other rumors are out there? I mean, the, the Red Sox. The is short stop one. That's pitching. the one. Well, let's talk well, about starting. Let's talk about that one. Okay, fine. Yeah, go ahead. Well, just really because we can knock it out quick. They yeah. obviously need another starting pitcher. Um, the only, like you said, the only starting pitchers who got qualifying offers were Verlander, Syndergaard, Eduardo Rodriguez, and Robbie Ray, at least starting pitchers. And then Rysel Iglesias, the closer. They, and they were at the Verlander um, the workout, workout, which yep. obviously like that's the Why wouldn't been. you be? Yeah. yeah. Why wouldn't you be? Um, but and, I don't but know. they're being connected to Steven yeah. Matz. I get that. I, I think anyone in that next group, I mean, I wouldn't mind them kicking the tires on Stroman. I mean, I don't want him. You don't lose I, a pick. Kick the tires. See what it would cost. You know, see where the merry-go-round yeah. goes. There's a lot of guys in that tier. I mean, look, Scherzer's not coming out east. I know people are probably saying. Oh, Max I would Scherzer, love that. I would love, Scherzer, I would love Max Scherzer. But yeah, I would love Max happening. Scherzer. It's not happening. He's staying out in California. Yeah, um, I think he's going to go to like Seattle or San Diego or the Dodgers. One of those three, probably. Probably. I mean, he or he maybe the Angels. I guess, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just I can't see. I can't see a guy like that. I don't think Kershaw is a fit for this team. No, hey, Kershaw's, Although, I, he's gonna... I, I, Ker- no, Kershaw's going to go to, he's going to go to Texas or he's going to stay in LA. I don't see any, yeah. he, cause he's not going to come here. But I, the way I see it, Ian, I see one of those type guys. And I think, I think the other guy they sign, I don't think it's two of those guys. I think it's one of those guys and a Andreessy type, maybe like a, a better, a richer man's I version. Would... I'd much prefer like if they went to from like the Matt's John Gray, Michael Pineda, Anthony Disclafani group. I, I think it's only one of them. I, I think it's only two. one I'm of them. I'm just saying I, I personally would like them yeah. to sign two of them, but yeah. I understood. And right. I just I mean, I think they need to sign two guys who can start. I'm with you on that. Because I don't want I mean, look, in theory, you could sign one, Pavetta's your four, and either how can how can Whitlock battle to the death to be the number five, or if they out pitch Pavetta, they out pitch Pavetta. Um, I can't see that being where they go with it, but yeah, I guess it could be. 
I, I just, I don't know that I see them adding another surefire starter to that mix. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I see it as another guy who can be that he can start if they need him to start, he can pitch maybe later in games if they need him to do that. So anyway, uh, yeah, I, I just, I think that's interesting, but let's, let's get to what you wanted to talk about. With the shortstops, the Red Sox today got linked potentially to Javi Baez, mm. which is an interesting fit. Um, uh, quite. I think it shows, though, that <sighs> what we talked about, you know, the Red Sox recognize that Xander Bogarts at shortstop might not be a thing that they want to stick with for the long term. Sure. And um, they want to bring in someone who at least can play like second base and a, who could play a very good second base and a competent shortstop as well. Mm-hmm. Or at least competent. I mean, Baez would be an excellent shortstop defender. Um. It's I, I get the link. I mean, he's he's from Puerto Rico. I, I guess him and Cora are quite tight, so that makes sense there. No pick attached, also, which is nice. And I didn't realize he was very good with the Mets last season. Bias. As much, yeah, as much he, as he, he made a lot more contact in the zone. He's he's a free swinger. Which yeah, I think in that sense, I do not love the fit with this lineup. No, I don't, I don't like the fit either with the lineup. But um, but he made like. Eight percentage points more, not eight percent more, but he rose from like I think it was his zone contact rating went from a percentage went from seventy percent to like seventy eight percent, which is a huge jump. And if you take out the twenty twenty season where obviously he was um, the the pandemic season, he's been like he was a three war three point five war or more players for the last three seasons, taking out that twenty and before that he was a two war player for two years. So like he's been a very good MLB player. It's just, I think the way he gets there um, and is just not, especially at the plate with the low walks, high strikeout. I just, I don't think they need another guy in the lineup like that. I just don't think that having him and Renfro and all those right-handed power bats at Dahlbeck who are going to strike out a ton is just a good fit with the way the baseball is going. But I mean, defensively, it would be a great move. You know, he's a very good defender at shortstop, um, second base, wherever he can play. He showed he could play second base last year. Mm-hmm. I just, I do wonder how much of it is teams just linking the Red Sox to drive up the market or not teams, excuse me, agents linking the Red Sox to shortstops to drive up the market, because I'm sure they're kicking the tires on all of them. But at the end of the day, I have a hard time believing that they're going to go spend big money on one of these guys, unless they truly have talked to Bogarts and are like, you're going to move to second base. This is what we're doing, which didn't seem to be the case when Chaim Bloom and Alex Cora had their end of season press conferences. Yeah, and, and that's worth noting is the Red Sox are going to be linked to a lot of guys who they are not going to sign, whether it is because they are going to try and sign them and won't outpay, uh, outpay, pay more than another team, whether it's because the agent is using them as a stalking horse, whether they are feigning interest to drive up the asking price for other teams. Uh, don't assume because the Red Sox are room- linked to Javier Baez. I mean, the, the apparently the actual... Link is one of many teams interested that, you know, that could be any level of interest that could be, we called and said we had interest. So I wouldn't read too, too, too much in, into that, but you know, look, uh, bias to me is maybe a better fit than like a Correa who's shortstop only. I think the flexibility is a good thing on a team where like you might need to massage egos with Xander Bogarts. Yeah, um, I mean, I I personally think Semyon is the best fit, but I like Semyon's fit. I like Chris Taylor's fit too. I also think that the problem with Semyon is that I think he's thirty one, whereas Baez is twenty eight. I want to say Baez. Baez, is I know, twenty eight right now. He's going to be twenty nine next year. Yeah, I'm on his fan graphs page right now. I believe Semyon is like thirty one already. He is older. I do remember that. Yeah, he's 31 right now. He'll be 31 yeah. at the start of the year, though. He's a September. He, ju- he, ju- he turned 31 in September. So, like, yeah. if they're both going to want four or five year deals, I don't love giving Semyon like a five year deal to yeah, take him to his mid 30s. That's the issue I think ha- I have there with him. And yeah. Taylor, those both buys and Semyon don't require uh, the QO, whereas Taylor does. And Taylor is also old. He's 31 also. He's actually older than Semyon. So, uh, Semyon, Semyon got a QO. I thought he could. I thought he got one last year with. Oh no, he didn't get no, one from Oakland last year. Oh, no, never he mind. absolutely oh, yeah. got a qualifying You're right. Offer. He didn't get one from Oakland last year, and everyone was surprised. Yep. Yeah, because Taylor and Semyon are about the same Taylor, age. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, I mean the thing I, with Taylor that I love. I mean, it's a great fit for them because he can play infield and outfield. Well, he can basically slide right into Kike Hernandez's role if he walks after the second and final year of his contract. Yeah. I, I would love to keep Hernandez around, but he's not going to come at that price again. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, Taylor, yeah, you're going to have to pay for him, but you know, this year you can start him at second base and you know, move him where the 20, hole is. Had a 29% striker rate last year. Yeah. I mean, he he's also, got swing and miss. He walks a ton, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, he also has, he's had an above average, you know, uh, WRC plus since 2017. Why is Almost it 2007? His, his BRF page is really messed up right now. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, He's a three to five war player, just as much as Baez is, and he plays more positions. I mean, he plays them relatively I, well. He's not, he's not a wizard di- like Baez, but I would disagree there, though. I mean, he's had, he's maybe not a shortstop. I give you that. Well, no, it's more that he, he's only had the one three war season, and that was last season. That's not true at all. He Isn't on it? Fangraphs war, he had a, he, he was oh, no, no, you're right. You're right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You're, you're right. You're right. You're right. Four point. What I meant to say is he's not, a, he's not consistent. Like Baez has had five straight seasons above 2.4 or something. Whereas Taylor was the last two seasons before this one was like one, four and one seven. Yeah. But well, so, well one, four last year is a three war season. I guess you're right. So Perfect. it's really just one season. It's really just 2019 was his He was down season. in 19. Yeah. I mean, he's a valuable player. Um, he's a very strikeout rate player, is not yeah. low. No. He's increased the walk weight, walk, walk rate a lot the past couple of years. Yeah. Um, you know, Steamer Why projects this... him next year to be a 1.8 war player, which is weird, but uh, it's because his defense seems to be regressing a bit. He had a kind a of little a little bit. I mean, that's but, true. but part he of it is he's playing year. all over the place. Right. Why is Would his... he be better? Oh, that's why is his. It's, oh, it's the postseason. That's why he killed it in the postseason this year. Got it. He did. He did. I was trying to figure out what was going on with his fan graphs page because they have like two 2021 tabs, and that makes sense. That, yeah, that one of them is they're showing the his they're, they're showing his postseason stats because he was so good. Um, yeah, I mean Taylor would be a nice fit, but I I just I don't know. I I'm confused. I don't know what they're gonna do. I I think that I think they will sign someone who plays those positions, whether it be like a Jose Iglesias type or like an actual, like one of the higher end options remains to be seen. And I think you obviously kick the tires and you see how the markets develop, but I'm just at the end of the day, I'm just not sold that Xander Bogarts moving Xander Bogarts to second base is a good move for the Red Sox long-term in terms of keeping him around, if that's the plan and moving him to yeah. second base this season, you mean? Correct. I think in the future okay, yeah. he needs to be, but right. Um, the other thing is I just want to briefly mention, cause I've seen some people on Twitter say it, what they do this offseason, even if they signed Javi Baez, has no like it's not a reflection of what they think of Nick York or Marcelo Meyer or Gina no. Downs. Have you seen that? I, I haven't. Yes, I've seen That's... it from multiple people. And yeah. like Jeter Downs, you could maybe say it because he's close yeah. to big league ready, but at but the end has, of the day, I'd rather yeah. I'd rather just sign someone good who I know is good and trade him if that's what you need to do. Like, mm-hmm. if you have to trade Jeter Downs because you reestablish his prospect value next year, that's fine. That's but, a good you know, problem that, to have. That, that's a good problem to have. Exactly. And then when, when it comes to York and Meyer, Meyer is Meyer's going to start next year in Greenville. They're screwed. Salem. Sorry. Salem. Yeah. So you Dollar think in the they, cookie jar. Yeah. And the next year's in Greenville year next year after he starts in Greenville ends in Portland. Like he's, he's three years away at least. And Nick York is two. as much as I love his bat. His defense has a lot of work that needs to be done. I'm not even like, and I'll tell you, like I've talked to people, there's, it's not a consensus that he's a second baseman. Let's be honest. Like there's a non-zero chance he ends up in left field. So I would not worry about the positional, like who's in the system right now. You know, that's a, if, if they are in three years, have a a stud shortstop and a stud second baseman already on their team. And those guys are ready. That's an excellent problem to have. Like I would not, what, what they do in free agency is not a reflection of what they think about those guys or, you know, anything like that. Just you, you're, you try to add the best possible players to give your team the best chance to win when you're a team like the Red Sox. And if that's adding, you know, Javi Baez on a, if you can get him on like a one, a two year, $50 million deal, I would do that in a heartbeat. Like that's the contract I would be interested in. If we're talking about like five or six years, probably not. Yeah. I mean, the only minor leaguer who I would, who I would let affect what I'm doing this off season, if I'm the Red Sox is Tristan Casas. Yeah. I mean, because I think there's a very the good hitter. chance that he is ready mid season. I and think there's a very good chance. I would not I mean, be surprised at all if he starts. Like, I don't think it's going to happen, but I would not be surprised at all if he's up by like, when is that stupid deadline? Like, oh, two, that if might they not keep even him down for a month. For, yeah. I mean, let's see what even is the case this year. Right. right? But, but it, let's assuming they change those rules, I would not rule out him breaking camp with them next year. Like, he, I mean, he's, <sighs> he's that good of a player. And it depends what it. they do. Put it this way. So I, I don't think you can go into the year with Bobby Dahlbeck 
as your starting first baseman with no other option, right? I also don't think they're going to go out and sign, like, I think it was the MLB Trade Rumors top 50 free agents post. One guy mocked Rizzo. Freeman to them yeah. and one guy and the, mocked Rizzo That's to them. not happening. I don't see that fit at all because you've well, got no, do you know, right do, there. Do you know how you have Dahlbeck going in? If they have only Dahlbeck going in, that tells me that they are basically saying, like, we're Casas probably giving Casas the job at the beat out of camp. Exactly. That's how you that that would be that my my you know the red flags will be going off if they don't sign anyone at first base because that means they're supremely confident that he's going to be ready next season either right at the mm-hmm. to start the season or, or soon. soon yeah, yeah. like I I mean and, I said I mean, yeah, we need to ahead. get ourselves out of this and, and I know you we've got to take a quick break here in a minute but um we have to get ourselves out of this Dombrowski era mindset of triple a just being the taxi squad for the major leagues because Heim Bloom, it seems pretty clear coming from the Rays, values triple a as a development level. Whereas Dombrowski all but said that he didn't well, care. No, but uh, but do, do the Rays like they just basically skipped it with Wander Franco because like, he's Wander Franco. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, right. But- like, that's that's the thing. I mean, what? yes, and they had Bruhan there. They, but the thing is, we also don't know. But that fair point and a point well taken. But I think we need to get ourselves out of the if a guy has played in AAA, he could be up tomorrow. That's not what they did with Duran, who had issues. I think if Casas goes to AAA and rakes for a month, yeah, okay, fine. But like, let's not assume he has because Tristan Casas last year did not dominate AA for any particularly long length of time. He was no, much he's... better. Once he got on track in August into September, yeah, but I, I also think his season last year was weird. Like it was quite and disjointed. I agree wholeheartedly. The Olympics and everything. I agree wholeheartedly. And, I mean, that's and why I'm not worried about it. And he is now uh, sporting a robust uh, league leading 500 OBP in the AFL. Is he up to that? No kidding. He's a 500 OBP. That's like, crazy. He's hitting 373, 500, 493. I love it when the OBP is higher than the slugging and you're slugging around 500. <laughs> right, right. But, well, and, yeah. and this is my favorite thing. What do you what do you think is strikeout to walk ratio is or walk just, to strikeout? Just say it because you got to go soon. 17 walks, 18 strikeouts. Yeah. That's like good. it's it, he's he, and you saw in the 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 Rising Stars game, which we'll talk about uh, later. All Stars. All Stars, excuse me. Sorry, it used to be called the Rising Stars. Uh, like that's just such a good swing. Like he just, <laughs> yeah, just waits back, you know, breaking ball. Oh, I read that early. I'm just going to hit a line drive single up the middle. And I'm telling you, once he decides he wants to hit for power, he's going to just hit tanks. He just, that's not the type of player he is though. Like I know I, I'm not a huge comp person, but he has that same approach that like Freddie Freeman approaches where I'm going to hit the ball as hard as possible every time I'm up at the plate and I don't care where it goes. And that's what Costas is. His goal is to hit the ball as hard as possible. He's, and if it leads to, it's going to lead to home runs because he's huge and has raw power. But at the same time, it also, I think he's conducive to a high average and a high on base percentage. So now uh, we're going to jump into one of those things that Ian is like everyone's favorite topic that ratio of how much it matters to how much people love to talk about it is probably as off as anything we discuss. I'm guilty of it though. I love talking about it. Oh, I'll sure. <laughs> but it's the rule five draft. I mean, um, we start talking about it like before the trade deadline. It's like, ooh, who could they trade that's on the Rule Five list? And, well, because yeah. it winds up mattering potentially. It does matter. Right? I mean, we and, saw and it this year, like in. Alex Alex Scherf. You mm-hmm. know, the the trade for uh, Hansel Robles. Scherf is someone who would have had to be protected, yep. most likely, and instead they got an MLB reliever who helped them down the stretch and turned it into their closer in the playoffs. So, <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, uh, I yeah, for, for a very short period of time. I, I think hey, it was a great two weeks or whatever it was. Yeah. Whitlock might have been the playoff closer for for longer, but yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. This Friday, the nineteenth, is the deadline to add players to the forty man roster to protect them from selection in the Rule Five Draft, and just to give folks who may be new to this process kind of a quick primer. Uh, the Rule Five Draft happens at the winter meetings every year, and of course, that means it may not even happen this year, frankly, if there's a work stoppage, but. Players signed at age 18 or younger, so basically most high school picks, uh, as well as young, the international free agents, the July 2 classes, need to be added to their club's 40-man roster within five seasons. Uh, players who signed at age 19 or older, so older high school guys, um, college players, JUCO players, those players need to be protected within four seasons. So you count it, um, the, basically the number of winter meetings from the time that they were signed. So 
for example, this year's, the 2021 draftees will need to be protected in 2024 if they're college players, 2025 if they are high school players. So think of it that way, um, high school players or IFAs. Uh, players who are not protected can be selected in the Rule 5 draft. Players selected in the Rule 5 draft much, must stay on the major league club of the team they're selected by the of the team they are selected by all season. Uh, if they are uh, hurt or do not, you know, if they're placed on the, the major league injured list, they have to have a minimum of 90 days that they're active. So if you don't get the 90 days in the year that you're a rule five pick, you have to finish the 90 days in subsequent seasons. So you can't just select a guy, stash, stash him on the IL all year and then have him be your property. Um, if the player makes it the full season, he is now in that organization normally. If the player doesn't make it, the team that selected him has to place him on waivers, at which point any other team in baseball could claim that player subject to the same Rule 5 rules. Uh, if the player clears, he must be offered back to his original team. Uh, a player is selected for, I think, 50K. I thought, I'm looking at this. It's on MLB.com. And, um, okay, what the rule, the rule is now, the selecting team pays the original team 100K. If the player is offered back, the original team must pay back to the selecting team 50K. So they get like half of it back if they don't keep them. So it's basically 50K to see if the guy will stick on the major league roster. And I think that's basically everything on the basics, Ian. Okay. Yeah. The Red Sox, the Red Sox 40 man roster right now has 33 players. And let's let before we get into the players who we think will be protected, I think this context is important. There are seven open spots. Ian, we were just talking. I could easily see them make another three spots or four tomorrow like this week yeah tomorrow, i would say three are easy if they needed to make three more they easily could yes and, and that comes into play not necessarily because we think that will happen this week no but because over the course of the offseason the red sox will obviously need to add players for the major league roster for example at least one reliever at least one starter at least Maybe. one more pitcher <laughs> potentially backup more there a backup infielder potentially unless they're going to hand that over to jonathan aruz which i don't think is what's going to happen. No, and he's another one who we didn't even talk about who could be on that list if they needed to. You think? Yeah. Uh, I would give him one more. I mean, he's a potential, like I said, he's potentially that guy. No, uh, I agree, but I'm saying guy. that, but that's just another option if like we really yeah. felt the need. Um, you know, Tim Locastro is one of those guys who could be DFA'd, but if he gets DFA'd, they probably need a backup outfielder. They're not going to bring up Jaron Duran to be the backup outfielder. No. So, you know, maybe I think that's actually, as I look at it, Ian, that's a roster spot we had talked about as potentially being clearable that yeah, they could clear it, but then they're going to have to fill it. Yeah, well, exactly. So, and there are several spots like that, but the point is that, I mean, if we get into the lockout, there aren't going to be any ads for a few months. So, yeah. So if, if the Red Sox are gambling on there being a lockout that could potentially last until February, that could play in to who they protect. Um, mm -hmm. So, so we'll see how this works. Um, but the point is the Red Sox do not have anything close to a log jam this year. They have a lot of potential protects, yeah. but I wouldn't call it a log jam because they have so much space. And yeah. some of these guys that we're going to talk about are already major league depth. Mm -hmm. So that, that it's different than having to add, you know, what was it? It was last year, right? That they had Jay to Groom. add Jay Groom, Jason Rosario, Hudson Potts, yeah. um, you know, a bunch of guys who had no, no chance of making no chance of, of making the of helping the major league team this year. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, looking at the list I have every single, I, you could make the case that every single player, except for an outfielder who I'm guessing everyone knows who I'm going to be talking about, uh, could pitch in the big leagues or play in the big leagues next year. Like you could make that case. Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. So let's start. We're going to go through, we've kind of roughly on our own put guys into categories of how likely it is. It's how likely the, that they're going to be protected. And I think we can then, within those groups, talk more about Ian, about how likely it is they will be selected. Because these are two very different, not very different, but two different calculations or projections. Yeah. Right? Um, so starting with the guys who will definitely be protected. Infielder Jeter Downs, right-handed pitcher Brian Bayo. 
there's no chance they are protected. Like it, it, it's elementary. I mean, yeah. And if either of them weren't, they'd be the first pick in the draft and it wouldn't even be a question. Like, right. There's right. They're going to be protected. So they're going to be protected. Can, they would stick if, if selected. You can uh, pencil those two in as two of the seven or more protected players for sure. Well, I mean, however many they wind up protecting. Yeah, two or whatever, fewer. two out of whatever. I guess, I guess we should maybe back up. I see them protecting no fewer than four. I think the minimum is four also, yeah. I think As many as eight. I think four to eight is the range. Mm-hmm. If I had to guess, I would say six is what I, it, like if I had to yeah. pen to paper, I would say six get protected, but I can make a case for up to eight mm-hmm. and as few as four. Yep. Second group that we made was the guys who are likely to be protected. Mm-hmm. I, I I would be very surprised. I think we have the same two in this yeah. group. Yeah. I'd be very surprised if neither is protected because, well, let me give you the names. Um, both AAA right-handers, Cutter Crawford and Josh Winkowski. Yeah. Um, those two players, as I need to let my cat in. Those two players can contribute this year. No question. Yeah, I mean, we've seen what we both can do actually this fall. Like Winkowski is a great example of just don't ever scout the stat line for anything pretty much because his his AFL stats are terrible. Um, I think he has like three strikeouts and four walks and like 14 innings or something. But um, he's been pitching in relief and he's opening some eyes there. And I, I think I talked about it last episode. We talked about the brawl. He's been up to like 99 with his fastball. Um with you know a decent breaker and the changeup that isn't a changeup, but it is a change. I don't even know. It's a changeup, but he calls it a changeup, even though it's like <laughs> 91 to 93, which okay. is just hilarious to me still. But uh yeah, uh, I mean he he could he's opened some eyes as someone who like, oh well, at worst he's like a reliever because yep. as a starter, when I saw him this year, he's like 94 to 96, dropped down to like 92, 94 mostly. But his stuff has really played up in the bullpen role, which he's been occupying the last couple of outings in Arizona. So yeah, he's a no doubter to be. And Crawford, same thing. I don't know if you have his his uh, D- Dominican uh, winter league numbers, but he's been crushing it down there. I think he hasn't given he's up. Had, a he's run. made three starts and hasn't given up a run. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and this against like fourteen like, innings. I would say which, like a quad A lineup. Like a, it's like a, it's weird. People always ask, and it's just it's hard to say. Because just the the skill level varies so because he, he's faced he's faced like Dominican legends like like Juan Francisco and like Hanley Ramirez, Ramirez. Yeah. but also he's faced like Albert Pujols who played in the big leagues this year and was a you know a decent enough player for the Dodgers or like top he's also, prospects like he's also faced like double A guys, guys exactly so it's AA, like so. I would say I would average it out around like triple A ish but he's been very good there he was good at the end of the regular season a lot of scouts I talked to still think he's a reliever. But could be a multi inning guy, and yeah. I think, as you said, the most important thing is he's big league depth. Like he could be up in the. I mean, he he made his debut this year, but he could be you know a full time big league depth next year, kind of like the way that they hoped Edward Bizardo was going to be this year before he obviously got injured. Right, right. So I I would be extremely surprised if either of them is left unprotected. Agree. That then leaves this this duo. Well, it's a weird duo. I, I would well, talk to before you. we get dry, d- dial in to that level. Um, from a bigger picture, there is this large group of guys who I would say ten guys in a thinner in a thinner year. You could see them considering protecting if they like didn't oh, sorry, have anyone nine. else in this group. Yeah, I have um, nine. Guys I, on that I, list. I have two, four, six, eight, ten. I have, I have, I have nine. like twelve. But I, I think nine. that there are there yeah. are there are tiers within this group of the like might get protected, might get picked. Like yeah. I'm yeah. not necessarily and I think there's like like I said, there's tiering within this group, but like there are like 10 guys. Like I I I think we were talking about this earlier, Ian. The Red Sox will likely lose someone in the rule five draft this year. I, I think so too. That doesn't mean not they won't necessi- get the back, but exactly. yeah. That was what I was gonna say. I, I think it, there's a decent chance they get the player back, but like there are players on this list who I, I think there is no chance they get protected and it wouldn't su- surprise me terribly if they got picked. Agree. Um, and, and the example I always go back to is Ryan Presley, yeah. who probably should have been more on our radar as a guy who might get picked. That was before my time for the record. Yeah. So don't blame he, me. He wasn't really, oh yeah, I, I, he wasn't <laughs> fair. 
he wasn't really on our radar. We knew he was interesting. We didn't realize quite how much teams liked him because yeah. we weren't, we just weren't quite as plugged in at that point either. Yeah. Um, but this group, I guess the, the top guys. Oh, I think the first two are the ones we should talk about for the most. Well, I, I'm not looking at the same list you are. So uh, I think, fair. I think kind of the, 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 the three, I think there's a top three that we need to talk about, which is mm. Gilberto Jimenez, Thaddeus Ward, Durbin Feldman. I cut it before Feldman. I think Feldman okay. falls in with some other relievers. Fair. And I think about. that's, I think that's about, I think I'm there too. Um, but I, I just, just like kind of the headliners basically yeah. for, for, I think uh, for big ask. names, I agree, but yeah. I just think that Ward and Jimenez are two separate cases because they both are not going to be ready to play next year and shouldn't be on an MLB roster, which is what makes me a little hesitant. I guess this, that's fair. They're, they're also there for very different reasons, but that's a, exactly. That's a, but, but that's my point. It's just neither of them like has any business on an MLB roster next year. And, Let's start with Jimenez then. Yeah. <sighs> It's a strange He's one. So far away. No, like if I, I was asked this, I was talking about this with, with someone uh, this week about what do you think him and his line would be if he was up in the majors? Oh, I, ugly. I genuinely think his batting average would be higher than his on base, which would be higher than his slugging. <laughs> and, and hear me out because yeah, he would get on base multiple times, like because of errors or like, you know, just he would speed. He, yeah, just slap speed. the ball to third, and that would. But you know, if you reach on an error, it goes goes as an out on your OBP. Like, so he's never going to walk either. Like, there's no chance he would walk well, and, in the majors. On an error, that's right. So that's why I think I genuinely think his like, and he's not going to walk. So his batting average could be higher than his on base because of that because they're going to give him. He would get like 50 at bats the entire season. Like he would have yeah, no business. He wouldn't play at all. And then he's not going for any power in the majors. Let's be honest. If he was up there next year, so his, his role on an MLB roster would be pinch runner. Yeah, because and because his defense, even, his defense regressed great. this year. His yeah. defense regressed this I, year. There's I no, saw him late in the year. He looked, th- and again, I don't want to draw too much from a one day look. It was a double. No, but Scout, Scout said the same thing that his he defense regressed this year. Yeah, he looked disinterested. And I think part of the, the thing with him and as is he needs to buy in more to the changes that he needs to make to reach the big leagues. Yeah, I think that he can get like he can fall back on. You know, you look at his stat line and he hit 300 this year. Mm-hmm. For most minor leaguers, that's good. But with the type of player he is, that's just not what like the way he got to 300 is not acceptable and not going to play at the higher levels. You know, you can't, you can hit 300 in the low minors if you're a 70 runner just by slapping and putting the ball in play. And that's what he chose to do this year. Once you get to the high minors, they're just going to bust you with fastballs up and basically like, you can't hurt us. So we're just going to throw as hard as we can past you every time. And that's just not going to work. You can't slap the ball to the majors. Like he's not Juan Pierre. He's not an 80 runner like anymore. He's not an elite like defensive center fielder. Now. He's a yeah. 70, yeah. but he's not an elite defensive center fielder. Oh, save is above up. He's above average. Well, no, no, my, that's my point with Juan Pierre yeah. though. Juan Pierre was that's an excellent saying. glove. He had yeah, a terrible arm, 20 arm, but he was an excellent defensive center fielder. You know, that, that just, that type of player doesn't exist anymore. And like, maybe you can get up and be a pinch runner, but like, even we've seen that doesn't like Raymond Fuentes was a 70 runner who came yeah. couldn't hit, and he's not been able to stick at the major league level. Jorge Mateo is the same thing. Jorge Mateo is like an 80 runner. He's probably faster and he's got more juice than him. And as, and he struggled to stick on a major league roster. Like yep. we've seen this type of player and it just doesn't, the way baseball is going, this player doesn't have as big of a role. And that's why Jimenez needs to get back to that swing that he showed in instructs last year. And um, and he's shown it in, at times in batting practice and before games and in spring training. He needs to get back to that. And I know something the organization's working on with him. It's just, it takes two to tango, you know? And mm-hmm. that's why at the end of the day, I think he gets protected though, because it's just too tantalizing the upside. You know, you can dream on a, like a four tool guy. If he figures it out, the power being the question mark, like it's just, he's got no business being on a major league roster. And that's why, the case for not protecting him is okay. If a team wants to take him, he, he's not going to stick. Yeah. Yeah. But I just, I think ultimately because they have so much flexibility and because of the uncertainty coming up with potentially not having to sign anyone for several months, I think that they protect him and then they'll just figure it out later. And I think you could also make the case that the way you, you, you justify it is you're swapping him for Jason Rosario on your 40 bit. And yeah. I'd much rather protect him than Jason Rosario, even like just taking everything else into account. If you told me you could protect one of these two players, I'm taking him in as in a heartbeat. And it's not even close. Yep. Rosario is already on the 40 man. So you can just swap those two. And then that's, you know, that's that position sorted. Cause if you were going to carry Rosario in the next year, you might as well carry him in as there's a better long-term prospect in that spot. 
And I think that, that that's a good transition into mentioning a point of part of the reason why this is a consideration is that it's easier for a team to claim a guy on waivers than it is for them to select him in the rule five draft, because claiming a guy on waivers, all he has to do is be on your 40 man roster and you can option him selecting a guy in the rule five draft. You need to keep him on the major league roster all season long, which is easier now with the roster at 26 and more guys stuck this year than in years past. Like they, I think half the guys who were taken James was saying earlier, Stop. Well, it was it was one of the best real five years we've had like right. in a while. Like you know, Whitlock, Akil Badu, um, there were a bunch of other it, like there really are a few solid other guys players. Who are pretty yeah. good, yeah, who were like solid relief pitchers. Yeah, oh, uh, the kid from the Orioles. Um, oh, Tyler Wells or Tyler whatever Wells, his name is. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So guys can stick, but that yeah. said, it's if you and and I'm looking at Rosario and Potts, and I think they're going to clear waivers. Like, never um, mind. Get the yeah, rule five. I, I would agree. I, I don't like, think he. At this like point, maybe, maybe, maybe one of them gets cla- maybe one of them gets claimed. But like, maybe. if they get claimed, do you really care? No. Like, it's... I'll be honest. I saw both of them extensively this year. I, I, I think Rosario has a better chance of getting in the majors than Ponce does. But I, I don't see either of them as anything better than like a fringe, you know, twenty fourth to twenty sixth player on your bench. Like, right. he's like an end of the bench player at best. I just, yeah. And and that's the thing. The thing is, it's like is keeping them on the 40 man roster worth the 5% chance if that well and I, and I and I also take? think and this is something that I actually wasn't even considering moving or having that those guys spots could be in play when I was doing my initial calculations is if you're going into next year neither of them is going to help you next year no like let's be honest and Jimenez isn't either we can get that but some of the other guys when we get further down the list like that you mentioned Thurman Feltman Victor Santos um, Frank German, Zach Kelly, some of the other guys like we'll talk about Ryan Fitzgerald, potentially all those guys could help you next year. Neither of those two guys are going to help you. So it just, yeah. you're not, I don't think you keep them on the roster at the, you know, at the risk of losing someone who actually could help you next year. But anyway, let's, should we talk about yeah. the other person with the big question marks in well, this area? The, I mean, the other one's Thaddeus Ward, who is going to be out all year. Most likely. I mean, if he comes back, it's going to be like the end of the year, a couple of starts, you know, in the car in the complex type deal um because when did he had a surgery in what may like may yeah yeah he had it, he had it later than mata did yeah so because he had made a couple starts i think right so i think he made one start or two one and a half he, starts yeah he, yeah he got hurt a second start the thing with ward is that if he were 22 i would feel a lot more strongly that he'd get protected yeah, this is that's the tough part. And it's he's gonna I mean, come. He's gonna come back. He's gonna be twenty six, having pitched eight <clears throat> innings in Double A in yeah. his career. Yeah, is I that, didn't realize that at the time, and that was yeah, that was really that threw me for a loop. It was like ooh, like he's old. Yeah, and and it's it's just it is what it is. Look, he was a college draftee on the older side. You know, it's not like he spent three years in the complex or something. But no, I mean, if, if anything, he blew through the system. I mean, he was twenty nineteen. He was drafted in 2018, 2019. He made it to Salem, which was high A at the time. In 2021, he started in Double A. Like he, yeah. he, you know, he did everything he needed to. And it's just, it's, it's just rough timing. And, and the thing is, so the team that selects him is going to put him on the 60 day DL all year this year, or this coming year. And in 2020, and in 2023, he's going to need to spend 90 days on the active roster. Yeah. Before you can even send him back down to the appropriate level. Now, mm-hmm. he, everyone keeps like I keep reading. He's potentially like the Red Sox version of Garrett Whitlock. The difference is the Red Sox selected Whitlock, like in the equivalent of like selecting Ward next year. Yeah, because he was ready to come in and pitch. I mean, you saw Whitlock pitch the entire season. What he threw like hundred innings between the regular season basically. playoffs. Yep. Yeah, so it's a different situation that said i mean the more i think about it, it 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 we keep we said at the time that he got hurt it's going to be fascinating to see what they do on on the rule five selection with him i still think that i'm leading towards them protecting him now i agree and it's just because they have this extra room and they always could do and, and and they showed a willingness to do it last year and i understand it was a different case and it would be different if ward had to stay on there for the whole season they could just do what they did with uh, Eduardo Rosardo and just stick him on the MLB 60 day. And if they did that, you know, yes, he would get service time and, or what he, he would have to get, he'd get a nice pay raise. But if, you know, if you were showing that at the end of the day, you're burning an option with him, does that really matter if he's going to be a 26 year old, you know, 27 year old, by the time he comes back, if he's using all three options, it's not going to be with you. 
So I think that I wouldn't rule that out either as a way to keep them around is just, you know, yeah. When they get to March or whatever, they just sixty day in. And well, I don't even think they need to wait till Mar- they need to do it in March. I think you could do wait, and if you need it, yeah, wait. If you need the mid-season. well, whenever you need the spot, yeah, exactly. Because but you I saw I, with I, Brian Mata, they kept him on the forty man all year to avoid having him earn the service time. And I think, but I think for, deal with him. But for Mata, I year. think it makes more sense because I think younger. he's younger, and Mata is someone that wears Ward like he's by, still <laughs> burning options though. Right. But the thing is, with a guy like Ward, if you're burning, he, is he really going to burn all three options to the point where you care? Like, yeah, no, that's I just think thing. find I that mean, unlikely. 21, 22, 23. If he's not ready by 2024, something went wrong. So, Whereas like Mata, because of his talent, or that 25, is, sorry, it would be 22, 23, 24, and then 25. 2025, he'd have to be ready by. Whereas like Mata, that talent is, I mean, he's a, he's a better pit prospect than Ward is. And you know, I would wait longer and I think his development could be slower. Whereas I think Ward, we're going to know pretty quickly what he is when he comes back, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. he's either going to be someone, they just move to the bullpen to fast track or they're like, all right, his stuff's back. We'll continue to develop as a starter. But yeah, I I think that um, I would lean towards him being protected, but with both Ward and him and as they could go, it, it, whichever way they went, it would not surprise me if that makes sense. With the remaining guys, Ian, let's group them into kind of, I think there's readily, there's some groups that you could throw them into. And I think Feltman, we've kind of highlighted, is in this group of high minors arms. Yeah. Mostly bullpen ish. Mm-hmm. Victor Santos being potent, the player that the Red Sox got for CJ Chatham from the Phillies, being the lone kind of exception. To, I mean, potentially a reliever, but maybe a slight chance to start. Yeah. You're looking at Durbin Feltman, Frank German, bullpen arm, Zach and, Kelly, bullpen arm. And did they mention German as someone who he's moved to the bullpen and that's he's going to be in the bullpen? I don't think he's going to be Most going likely, back to yeah, start him and AJ yeah. Politi. I think the plan the plan seems to be to keep them in the bullpen. Yeah. Um, Joan Martinez, Joan Martinez is already there. You've got Caleb know, Wharton, Triple A. You've got, you know, like I said, I mentioned German. Um, but for Feltman's, me, the one that's going to be the highlight for a lot of people. Yeah. For me, it's like, there's four guys in that group. It's Santos, Feltman, Kelly, and German. And if I had to pick an order to protect them in, it probably would be Santos, Feltman, Kelly, German, Hmm. but Feltman's a tough one because his numbers are great. I don't know if you have them up, what he did in Pawtucket last year. Feltman. Yeah. Um, it's just, it, it, I saw him in Portland and then I got several reports of him in Pawtucket and his stuff just wasn't, it's still not the Worcester, same. You as, mean? Sorry. Yeah. Worcester dollar cheese. In the, dollar in the That's jacket. like $5. I think I've said it like three times or four you, times. You, did. You, did, you tripled down on it. It was, pretty um, great. uh, but Feltman's stuff just, it's still not back, you know? But yeah. So in Worcester, 24 and a third innings, 25 strikeouts, four walks. Um, his whip was below one. I mean, he was very good. 59 ERA. It's just the way he gets there is just weird. Like it's deception. It's that funky delivery. And he was like, he was 90 to 93 in August in Worcester. That's just not, you know, when I first saw him down in Lowell during his MLB debut, or excuse me, his minor league debut after his, in his draft year, he was like 94 to 98, you know, mostly 96, 97. Now he's pitching in the low nineties. It's a deception. You know, he's, he's got to command it sliders, you know, sliders good. It's a, it's a decent enough secondary pitch. It's definitely, it's a major league arm. But it's just how much upside is there? You know, is he's not a potential fu- – it's not a future closer anymore. He's a future sixth inning guy, maybe a seventh inning guy if you really want to dream. And I just – I could go either way on him. Um, whereas I think Santos has slightly more upside. I think there's a chance he could start. I think the stuff is, you know, pretty similar. It's just I think I like Santos's command profile better. So that yeah. they're kind of like in a separate group for me. Um, but I think because they have the room, you could make the case to protect both. You could make the case to protect neither. If I had to guess, I would think that one of the two of them would definitely be protected, maybe both of them. But I mean, yeah, it's it's a tough one to call. And for those who are wondering, like, why are these guys mentioning Zach Kelly? Um, go look up Zach Kelly's numbers. He was dominant in double A at age age 26, and he was repeating the level. Um, but in in 21 outings, uh, 26 and two-thirds in it of an inning, 40 strikeouts. Uh, so he had a you know 13 and a half K per nine, walked 13 in those innings, gets promoted to Worcester, uh, 
18 and two thirds, 29 Ks to five walks. So, you, you know, 14 Ks per nine, only 2.4 walks per nine. So he cut his walk rate by going up a level, whip below one. He was really, really good this year. And he was a priority minor league free agent re-signing. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and I think the interesting thing with me is I saw Kelly, I saw both of them this year, obviously. And I think Kelly has better stuff right now than Feldman does. I mean, Feldman gets back to like his 94 to 96 with a hammer breaker. Then obviously that changes, but that's just not who he has been. He hasn't been it for three years. So I'm not going to project that to come back. I saw Kelly this year and it was, you know, 93 to 95, super heavy fastball. I don't know if you can bring up his like ground ball, fly ball splits, uh, but um, yeah. it was like a heavy fastball. Guys just couldn't square it up at all. Like he gave up two home runs all year. Um, you know, he had a low, a high eighties cutter, um, change up a low eighties. I like the separation was like 80, 83. I, I put like a 50 on it, cutter, maybe a 45, 50. And then he also had a slider, um, but he didn't really throw. I guess he, well, I knew he, I was told he had a slider, but he didn't throw it this year. It was more of a three pitch guy. He was, you know, fastball cutter change up, but he was the type of guy that I think can succeed in major league baseball right now. And especially, you know, with the premium on velocity out of the bullpen, I'd much rather have a guy throwing 93 to 95 than 90 to 93. But Right. You know, it's, it's just going to depend. I, it, he's someone that I know teams have been interested in before he, they found out he was re-signing with the Red Sox. And then I'm interested to see what they do with him because I do think he's someone that I would not be surprised at all if the team selected if he didn't get protected. Because right. he's so I think he could stick in a major league bullpen for a year, especially on a rebuilding team. It's interesting to me they didn't try to like ask him to do like the Patriots training camp cut thing where like Hey, look, we'll we'll sign you. We promise. Just wait until after the Rule Five draft. But I'm Haven't sure his agent was before. like, "Nah." Haven't they done that before with someone? Uh, well, I, it, sometimes they uh, like announce a bunch of minor league free agent signings after gotcha. the game passes. So, yeah, sorry. And, and his, his ground ball rate last year was like in Double A was almost sixty percent. Like, yeah, I was trying to pull it up. I didn't get there. Yeah, and it, and in AAA, it was like you know forty five. It was a smaller sample, but it averaged out. You know, it was over fifty percent. And it's interesting. I'm actually looking at his, his steamer projection for next year is actually kind of good. You know, it's like a mm-hmm. four two ERA, eight nine, eight point nine K nine. Uh, BB nine is a little high, but like, you know, he's an interesting guy and someone to keep an eye on, especially if he doesn't get protected. Yeah. Um, then on the position player side, I mean, I guess it's just a couple of guys, a few guys left to, to kind of group. You've got a couple of utility guys and a catcher. Um, Cole, Cole caught him as the catcher and he's, he's had a decent Arizona fall league. Yeah. He's been good. His, he's been his good. well, his numbers, but are it's just, like three games. His, his numbers are goosed by three really good games. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, that's the problem with his numbers. Um, I can't see him getting protected. No, the problem with it, the problem with him is a team he's, could pick him. Maybe the problem I don't with see him, it. The problem is his defense is his weak point. And yeah. if you, the catchers that get picked in rule five are usually glove first guys mm-hmm. and he just, or I'm, strong glove generally. Yeah. Least. Or, and I'm, I'm not convinced he's a catcher long-term. Yeah. I think he might be like a DH or a first baseman. And I just that's think a, that, yeah. n- no, I, I think that that's the thing that's going to hold him back is that, um, is that what, what we just said? Like the and then the lack of defensive ability. Last but by no means least are a couple of utility guys in Ryan Fitzgerald, who who split the year between double A AA and triple A, and Sedan Rafaela, who was down in low A. Different in the sense that they are at very different points in their development. Rafaela was the system's defensive player of the year, as named by the organization. Uh Ian, I just think he's way too far away, especially with the stick. The problem is he does enough that he could stick for a year and doesn't yeah. really want to it's get a tough that time, kind of a guy into the system. Uh, Rafael just, is a tough one. I love his glove. Uh, I saw it in Salem and saw him play in yeah. above it, uh, plus center fields and shortstop. And even like it's a very good glove and he has great position versatility. Like he's someone that in like three years, if he told me he was like one of the, he was a very good bench player for the Red Sox to be like, yep, that makes a lot of sense. Maybe four years, but the problem is he's just so far I, at the plate. It's super raw. You know, it's super aggressive first pitch swinging. Just, you know, I'm going up there trying to hit his pitch recognition is below average. I don't think he gets protected, but if a team really likes the glove, 
in a weird way, I think he almost has a better chance to stick than Jimenez because he's someone I could be, I would be comfortable like throwing out defensively at, at the major yeah. league level, even now. And but our national just, league team doing a defensive if if they don't do the universal DH, not exactly they're know before the rule five draft right. in theory. Well, no, the, the rule five draft wouldn't happen. Remember? I guess that's true. So maybe they would know. Maybe yeah, they, no, would. they probably wouldn't know because it wouldn't happen until. Um, yeah, but if they weren't getting, if they weren't probably going to universal DH, like with with, the, with double, um, double switches. Yeah, like, I don't know. It, it's I, just wouldn't you want to throw him in late in an inning? Late in the oh, game, absolutely. Last three innings of a game. Yeah, yeah, and his glove is way more ready than Jimenez is, but it's just. I don't think. I just don't think. It, I think it's too big of a gamble, and and I do think at the end of the day, he's not like. There isn't that much upside with the bat. At the end of the day, he's like he's like five eight. You know, he's not a big kid. There's just limited upside with the bat that I don't think it's worth. You know, burning a roster spot the entire year on well, if you're another team. It's not even only the entire year. It is. He's going to need three years, at least. Well, it's the point so, is you know he'll come he'd be sk- jumping from low A to the ma- to the majors. And then you'd have to send him back to high A. You know, the year after yeah. maybe double A. Well, I mean, it has half. If the Reds go ahead, sorry, sorry. I was just gonna say it, it, teams have done that before too. Um, it's like usually the, with like pitchers who throw ninety five or above, or so well, I've seen it with a position player. Luis Torrens comes to mind as someone right. it happened with. Mm-hmm. You know, he was. Um, I'm just trying to bring up his stats right now. He was. Uh, why didn't that work? Well, why? Well, why you look for it? Let me just mention too. The other thing is that like the problem is if the if you're the Red Sox and you protect him this year. Is there what are the chances he's ready by 2025? Like I mean, you're, yeah, you're starting that's to burn question. options. Yeah. So to me, it's worth risking taking the it, risk yeah. this year to get the extra year to develop him before his options run out. Like fair, fair. if he has another year next year in Greenville, like he did this year, they probably have to protect him. Yeah. Cause Tor- Torrance, it, Luis Torrance is a catcher. Um, and right. he was he was drafted. Uh, it, by the Padres in the Rule Five, out of A ball, he paid. He played uh, 52 games in 2016 between Low A and um, and uh, and uh, the Penn League, I think. And he went to the majors. He hit 163, 243, 203, and then they sent him to High A the following year. And he slowly worked his way back up to being like he crushes lefties now, and he's actually like a solid major league catcher, like a backup head catcher. But it's just. You know, that's what you, you know, he would go up there and he would hit 150, like, and that might be generous. Right. And as you said, the option thing is more of a concern. I think that you would be burning so many options with him that he might not even be ready for the majors by the time those options are all up. A player who that is not a concern for, and probably the last one we should really go in any depth on Ian is Ryan Fitzgerald, Mm -hmm. who I would not have a hard time seeing sticking if selected. No, you, you know, he's a, he, but, but what's the no upside? upside? That's the thing. Is it, <laughs> yeah. is the upside worth protecting him? But that said, using kind of the analogy, we use not analogy, but the, the discussion point we used earlier, would you rather have Ryan Fitzgerald or Jonathan Aruz on the 40 man roster at this point? Um, Aruz, Aruz, really? Aruz, yeah, I, a better glove for the role, I think. I think, think I think Fitzgerald would give more offensive ability, but I, I like Arrows' glove. Um, and like, yeah, Fitzgerald. I, I mean, he was, don't he was, agree. Really? Yeah. Fitzgerald I, I, can play a good short. Like he can play a perfectly fine shortstop, and I don't no, think Arrows can do that right now. I think I would be fine. I think he's fine at shortstop when he's played okay. there. Interesting. Um, I think he's like you know it's not great, but it's like an, he's an, he's like a fifty defender. Like, whereas I think Fitzgerald is probably about the same. I mean, you could make the case looking at it. I mean, you were just based on numbers from Worcester last year. Uh, Fitzgerald was, or I guess Fitzgerald didn't really play in Worcester, but if you look at just their minor no, league it was numbers weird. from last he got, year, he got called up when they like moved him, Sogard and like McKenzie up a level each, and they moved them all back down when the Olympians came back. Yeah, because um, his numbers, you know, he's a 271, 351, 505 in Portland, 262, 340, 571 in Worcester. Like, he had overall, I mean, he had 16 home runs, like 270 average. Yeah, you, I mean, the thing, though, is Aruz is, what, five years younger? I think he's 23. Mm-hmm. He is. Much younger. Yeah, he's 23. Well, because the thing with Fitzgerald, though, is that he's an indie ball guy. Like, that's why yeah. he's that much older. And there comes a point where it's like, he's close to the majors, he's close to the majors. Yeah. Right. But and then again, it's like I would not be surprised at all if they protected him. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't protect him. Like and I would be surprised that's, if he got popped. 
Yeah. yeah. Like, although, That's kinda... again, it's an upside thing. Like, are you using a 40 man pick, a uh, uh, rule five pick to get a potential bench utility guy? Maybe. I mean, Richie Martin got picked. Like, that's who he is. But he was also like a 60 defender at shortstop. Right. It's just <laughs> the thing that's weird, too, is like some of the bad teams are the ones with 40 man issues. Like, Cleveland's not good and they have like a major problem. Like, there was, I was reading it, I think it was BA was talking about it. Like, they have a prospect, uh, Joensky Noel, who's in mm-hmm. low A, and he hit like 360 this year and rakes. And they're like, oh, do we add him? Like, he's a low A first base only DH guy. <sighs> right. Who hit, I mean, I don't know if I can bring his, he had like 360, like with an over. And the thing is, is that's just not a player type that, I mean, you, you know, we're not talking about Pedro Castellanos, Devlin Granberg, Tyreek Reed, all Rule 5 eligible. Because that's not a player type that gets picked in the rule five he hit, draft. He hit 340, 390, 615 this year between rookie ball and high A. Like, and he's a 20 year old, you know, third baseman, first baseman, probably, you know, first base DH type. And right. what do you do with someone like him? Like, and yeah. they're, you know, a team that you could, I would say, if in a normal year, you would be worried about, you know, potentially popping one of your guys, but they have their own issues they have to figure out. So mm-hmm. the last guy that, we haven't talked about that I, I think could potentially be picked would be Chase Shugart. I don't think there's any chance he gets protected. I could see a team thinking that, Hey, let's tr- see, let's bring him into camp and see if we throw him in the bullpen, what it looks like. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I his think stuff he was stick. He was like 95 to 90. He was, you know, throwing hard when I saw him in would have been say Greenville. Greenville. Um, I definitely yeah. just ran through like every affiliate in my head, but um, yeah, like him, Caleb or AG Politi are all guys that like, if they get protected, if they get picked, whatever, like, they're not really going to care. Like yeah. they're hard throwing righties. Um, but I could see it happening is the reason yeah. I, I wanted to bring them up. And then um, like the other one, funny one you mentioned was like Franchi. Like, well, that's the thing is I've got a list of guys who like are worth noting that aren't going to get picked. Franchi Cordero cleared waivers. If he cleared waivers, he's not getting picked in Wolf five, which is a weird thing to think about. But like he, if a team wanted him, they would have claimed him and optioned him because I think he has an option left. So right. I just, yeah, I don't see him getting picked. Um, the Tyler brothers, Tyler Esplin and Tyler Dearden are both rule five eligible. They're not getting picked. Um, I mentioned Granberg, Kyle Hart, not going to get picked. Uh, I, I can't see that happening. Uh, a couple of interesting guys. If he had been healthy this year, Aaron Perry would have been an interesting potential guy to discuss. He's just always hurt hard. though. Yeah. But he's just, he hasn't been able to stay healthy at all. And then uh, Eli Marrero, I thought was an interesting guy who's rule five eligible. High A catcher. I liked him when uh, I saw him. I mean, I, I think I, he's someone I've athletic. had in my top top sixty. He can really he's good at defense. Problem for him is there's no bat. You know, he's mm-hmm. he's fast, but it's not the bat's not there. And he's solid defensively, but it's it's like a fringy arm. He gets by on a really quick release. It, it's not like a no doubt, you know, MLB catcher, I would say, defensively. Um, but yeah, I mean it's a good name to keep in mind, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So those were really the guys that kind of, I felt worth mentioning. You can get the full list of guys. Uh, we've, we've transitioned over to our depth chart on our team rosters page on the website. So you can head over to socksprospects.com slash org. Uh, that has the full depth chart and you can see there who the rule five eligible players are and who the players are who are on the 40 man roster. So obviously we will be updating that on Friday. Um, and I think, look, I'm sorry. Y'all. I know I said we would do emails. It's really late so we're going to cut it. We will do an extra big mailbag next episode, which will be coming next week because we want to get one out before Thanksgiving for your Since traveling. Pleasure. Everyone is traveling. And yes. plus there actually will be things to talk about. We'll react to the 40 man deadline. Maybe the Red Sox will have made a move, you know, things can happen between now and then and got then, a bunch of emails yeah. building up, so. and send more just so Chris gets mad. I, I won't be mad. I'll be heck quite happy. In fact. <laughs> I know. Uh, but uh, they, yeah, so thank you all for those. Again, the email is a podcast at SoxProspects.com, so send those in. You can follow us on Twitter. Follow Ian at Ian Cundall. That's I-A-N-C-U-N-D-A-L-L. Follow me at SP Chris Hatfield. And follow the website at Sox Prospects. You can also follow the website on Instagram, although, full disclosure, not a whole lot getting posted at the moment. If, if you are a graphic design type person, by the way, shoot us an email um, at info at SoxProspects.com. We would love to bring on another graphic design type person. Um, if, if that's your bag, by all means, please reach out. If you're looking to, you know, get a portfolio or something for applying for gigs or something of that effect, please reach out. There's definitely an opening there. Uh, of course, thank you to everyone who supports us on patreon.com slash socks prospects. And we want to give a shout out to our $5 level supporters. 
That'd be Kyle C., Tyler Woodraw, Jeff Trainer, David Doan, Tim Harding, Bill Stanton, Deb Kent, Eleven Kirkwood, Hurricanes One, Chris Fox, James O'Hara, Nathan Kenyon, Andrew Wallen, David B., Ben Burnett, Al Metal, Kevin Catrides, Ben and R.I., Paul Denier, Lendl Martin, Cassandra Gupta, James McMahon, Stephen Gregory, James Bailey, Andreas Goldstrand, Corey Parrott, Forrest Perkins, Mark Herman, Aaron Meta, Jeff Harwood, Jimmy Mountain, Brian Cowan, Dusty G., Pavel, Jordan Shabbat, Jeffrey Scruggs, Nicholas Staropoli, Bob Intron, Mike Kawano, Chris Bollier, Curtis Waltman, Michael Stewart, Keith Fox, Caleb Farron, John Kane, Andrew Kay, Tim Ware, and Michael Murphy. Um, thanks to Ian. Thanks to all of you for listening. I think that's everything. We'll be back at you next week. Thanks a lot, everybody.